All right, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like this to kind of be kind of an interactive study. I don't know how effective that can be with no microphone where people can hear you if, if you have a thought or something. Uh, but I would like to have some interaction because I think it works better that way with the, with the Bible study. So bear with me for a few minutes, and then I've got a couple questions for you to, to think about. And uh, you don't have to answer them on paper. It's not a test. I, I hate tests. Um, just to get some interaction from you. But I had a topic here that had come to mind a couple of weeks ago, and it had been on my mind from something that had taken place, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. But first of all, what is the one thing that we really dread in life? Now, there are, it's a big subject. There are a lot of thoughts that are going to come to mind, but I'm thinking of one particular word that we just do not like to have take place in our life. Well, that leads to what I'm talking about. I figured that'd be the first comment. That, that leads to what we're looking at. Uh, the, I'll give you a hint. The word starts with C, and it's six letters long. Change, change. We hate change. We just dread it when it happens. And death does bring major changes in your life. And I guess if I'd have had a little more time, I would have would have brought some of these facts and figures about what causes the most stress in life. I know it's death, it's divorce, it's financial problems, it's loss of your job. There's all sorts of things that we go through that bring change to us and that we're not real crazy about because it upsets our life. And it doesn't matter whether it's your life personally with your family or whether it's with the church or with your job, um, it affects you and change is not very pleasant. Because one of the things that when we have change, it affects our traditions in life, traditions in your family, traditions in your, your church, the way you run your life, the way you live your life. And it, it, it's tough to deal with. It really is. I've, I've just spent 38 years in the business world running my business. My son just took it over this last week, finally, out of the blue. Uh, it's a miracle he even decided to do that. But he'd been in IT work for 23 years and decided that he was willing to do it because I was wanting to get out of it. I, I can't do what I used to do. These, these changes you have to think about, you have to plan for because you know they're going to happen. And when you reach a point where you can't do what you used to do, you know, business begins to suffer. You have to deal with the changes that take place. And we respond differently to change. One, it's common to all of us, is we don't like it. And two is we usually get frustrated, we complain about it, and if things get difficult enough, we just quit. We move on to something else and to try to avoid it. What really prompted this topic today, and, and I got a title here for the Bible study. I always put a title for everything to keep me focused. Um, but the title of it is Changing of the Guard. And what prompted this thought was a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from a friend of mine that informed me of the death of Burke McNair, who was a minister that had been around for years and years and years. How many of you remember that name? He came to Indianapolis and was a minister there in the Indianapolis church back in the late 60s when I was in high school. I think he was there about two or two and a half years. So it was probably around 67 and 68 and, and maybe part of 69 because my last year in high school, uh, Dennis Pyle was the minister there when I came to, to college in 1970. And uh, Burke McNair was, was a, a major impact on my life at the time because I remember what kind of an individual he was. But the, the, the thought is, he was around a long, long time. Preached a lot of sermons. Was a servant in the ministry for years and years and years. And over the last few years, we've lost, I put down four names of major people from four different organizations, four different churches of God that really have been around a long time. Burke McNair, Ron Dart, Rod Meredith this last year, and a man who just died here a couple weeks ago, Ian Boyne down in Jamaica, which I didn't know he was connected with CGI, but uh, quite noted down there apparently and from what I understand they're having to rent a soccer stadium for his funeral because he was connected with a lot of people a lot of important people I never knew the man but the point is these people have been around a long long time and 
when you're around a long time, you really have a lot of influence and impact on people's lives. So when we have these things happen, we have to deal with it. We have to make adjustments. We have to make course corrections. Do you, a lot of you feel this way, or you're under, you understand it because you've had to deal with it too. Somebody that you're really close to, you're really uh, tied with, you've really experienced you know, help from them, whether in the ministry or something else, when these changes occur, you know, you're left there with trying to think, I gotta regroup, what am I gonna do now? And it's not easy to do. So as we, as we think about a lot of these things, we, we know that we think of the past glory, the, the past excitement, the past part of our lives where we really enjoyed certain things to be a certain way, but when these changes come, we have to have things altered, and it's not easy to do that. A lot of us want to be cared for. We want to be taken care of, and, and spiritually that's very important. We want the church to take care of us, to, to help us through our difficulties and through our problems, and that's the responsibility in the ministry of serving the brethren and serving the people, and it's a very important part of being a, a part with the church and with Christianity, with, with this way of life. But when our comfort zones are compromised, we really have to put forth some effort and to do some things. <clears throat> and the point I want to make is all of us are involved in this. It's not just the ministry, it's all of you as well. You know, that statement, iron sharpens iron, that you read back in Proverbs is very, very true. Um, the fellowship, the the interaction and, and the being together with one another certainly is very, very important to help people get through some of these crises. And we know it's going to happen. It's a part of life. We're still physical. We know that every morning when we get up. We still have to fight health issues. We have to fight of all things. And I never thought I'd have to deal with this because it was all supposed to be over with in 75. I never thought I'd have to deal with age. But life goes on and life does affect us. What does God expect us to do? Good question. A lot of times he expects us, first of all, to do what? Ask him for help, and he expects us to act. We can ask God all we want, we can have faith all we want, but we can't just sit there and expect God to do it for us. I've learned that in life very quickly. God doesn't do things for us. God may help us to come to see things or understand things or, or give us the strength and, and the knowledge through the Holy Spirit or through him, through his word as to what we need to do. But we can't change it if we just sit there and think about it. We've got to do something. And that's tough sometimes. What I want to do, the time that we have, is to look at, look at history. Look at what others have done. Look at what had to be corrected and what had to be, to ch be changed because the, the examples that we're going to look at, and there, there's so many you can look at and think about, the, the adjustments that had to take place, the rebuilding that had to occur, the reorganizing that had to occur in their lives was something that was traumatic for them in these cases that we're looking at. And, you know, remembering some of these facts of the past maybe will help us realize that we're not the only ones going through this, that it affects everyone. It truly does, down through history. What is our job supposed to be as a church, as Christians, as people who are part of the body of Christ? Now, there's a lot of, lot of different thoughts on that. Any, any thoughts on that, just comments? What is our job? What's our responsibility? Well, we're supposed to preach the gospel and we do that what? Well, we do that not only through the internet and, and through the media, but we also do it through our lives. That's, that's probably the best way to preach the gospel is through your life, the way you live. We are also, also supposed to care for the church, care for people, care for their problems and try to help them get through all of this. And, you know, of all the ways that God did, a, did that for us and, and tried to help us to do that is as Paul said, through the foolishness of preaching. We try to do that through the foolishness of preaching. Sometimes I wish God would just raise up stones and be through with us. I just, I think it'd be a whole lot better, a whole lot more effective. But he doesn't do that, does he? He makes us go through the work and makes us do it. 
One of the things that we need to do as we prepare this next generation, you know, I look at myself as maybe the second generation of, of the body of Christ with the churches of God. My parents, my mom in particular, brought me in when I was nine and a half years old. My parents are both gone now. Uh, so I'm kind of the second generation, and, and that's a staggering, sobering thought because I'm 65 years old. I'm looking at the next generation coming along, and I don't see a lot of the next generation coming along out here. If we took the average age of the audience, it would be elevated a little bit, wouldn't it? We don't have a lot of young people. It's a concern that I've got. My children are, my son's 42, my daughter's 39, never attended church since they were about three years old because, you know, they were born in the late 70s when things were heating up. They heard too much from the time they were born till 10 years old, 12 years old. They didn't want any part of it. Sad. It's sad. My daughter goes to the Church of Christ up here in uh, Fruitvale. Incidentally, that church that was burned up there, their auditorium a couple weeks last week was where my daughter goes to church. So, really tragic. My son goes to the Presbyterian Church, and, and he said he would never go to church again. Uh, he started going several years ago, which just floored me. So, maybe there's hope there. I, I don't know. Uh, the main thing is, we've got a job, and we've got to make sure that as, as we work through these, these obstacles in life, that we don't dampen the enthusiasm of the younger and the next generations as they come along. We've got to point them to God, point them to his word, and some of these examples to see that even though some of these things have occurred in people's lives, even though they've occurred in history that we're going to look at, they're the same things we go through. And they made the same mistakes sometimes that we make. And we have to hopefully learn to avoid that and correct that. Let's look at, look at a, the first one over here in the Exodus chapter 13. As we prepare the next generation and truly do work on that to try to help fix some of these problems that occur, and there are many, and it's, they're not just in our particular group. You know, if, if you look at the, the religious business, so to speak, throughout the world, they've all had their problems. It's very, very unfortunate, but it just has. But what we have to learn to do is we have, if, if we can't learn to give up the past, we cannot connect with the future. We can't change the past, can we? When I look at business and things that I have, have done in business, <clears throat> and I look back and I think, you know, I could have done this a little differently and it might have worked a little bit better. That's true. But I can't go back and change that with what's occurred back there. I have to take what I understand now, correct those mistakes, and move forward. Because what, what is it we want every generation to do better as time goes on? Any thoughts? Follow Christ. Correct. But in addition to that, following Christ, what do we hope occurs in the generations, that next generation's life? They get better. That's, that's our job, is, is, and it's, that's our job as parents. We, we want each generation to get better. We want each, each group of children and grandchildren, which I'm dealing with now. I never thought I'd have grandchildren. I never thought I'd have children to begin with, but never thought I'd have grandchildren. And here my oldest grandson is 18 and a half, or a little over 18. I mean, he could be married here in a couple years. And the thought of a great-grandchild, I hope it doesn't happen, but that's staggering. You know, where does time go? It just gets up and goes, believe me, and we have to deal with it. There was a man I worked with for about 15 years. I didn't ever work for him, but I worked with him, Ronald Dart, with Christian Educational Ministries. And he mentioned three things about God that I will never forget and I have memorized to the living end. I, I won't forget it. He said, he, sold, he said these things over a period of several years, but he said, one, God does not tell us everything. That's true. We would like to know everything, wouldn't we? We'd like to know what's going on, but God doesn't tell us everything. God, in many cases, isn't concerned with our comfort, is he? 
one of the examples we're going to read about in Exodus was the people of Israel coming out of Egypt. How long were they in captivity? A couple years? No. 400. That's a long time to be in captivity and be a slave. God sometimes isn't too concerned about our comfort. He wants us to repent and turn our lives around so he can embrace us, but he has to get our attention too many times. And finally, the one, the one that, that I like the best that, that Ron came up with is God doesn't ask our permission to do something, does he? We certainly wish he would so we would know what's going on and where we're headed, but if you're going to see from these examples, that's just not the case. Over in Exodus chapter 13, let's look at the first one. The first example I've got is Israel coming out of Egypt. Now, you know the story of Israel coming out of Egypt. They've been in captivity for 400 years. Uh, they didn't have freedom. They worked from probably sun up to sunset. That topic of slavery is kind of difficult to comprehend because we have freedom in every aspect of our lives. And our, I think you feel the way I do. We are so thankful to be able to have that. We just can't envision being a slave and living our whole lives as a slave. And some of these people lived their whole life as a slave. These people struggled day in and day out. They had forgotten God, and they began to plead with God for some help and some relief, and he finally gave it to them. It says in his Exodus chapter 13 and verse 21, And the Lord went before them after he had brought them out of captivity and gotten their attention. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud and led them on the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by the day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And so when he, they came out of Egypt, they had this visual understanding of who God was, literally, with God being with them day and night. You think, do you think the change was traumatic for them? Sure it was. Going from slavery to complete freedom with God's guidance and God's care. They had something they had to adjust to, didn't they? Oh, when they spoiled the Egyptians, you know, they were certainly very, very glad, very excited about it. You just can't imagine what, what they were going through and what they were understanding. But they had to make some changes in their life from being a slave and, have, and being told what to do day in and day out to suddenly having freedom is a dramatic change, isn't it? It takes some getting used to. Over in chapter, 30, chapter 14, verse 30, it says, The Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. That would be quite staggering for them, too, living under these people, and then God suddenly killing all of them and, and allowing them to see their dead bodies floating down the Nile River and wherever they were, uh, in that marsh area, and it says in verse 31, the people believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Well, I would too, wouldn't you? It took some thought to do that, but yeah, they, they believed God. But their whole lives were, were totally changed as they were coming out of, of Egypt. And how is it, how quickly things can change? Because what do you read in chapter 17? You read about a place that they went called Rephidim. They were out there in the wilderness, a very difficult place to be, and there wasn't any water. Now, you think with what they had seen, now put yourself in their situation. They saw God do what he did. They witnessed God day in and day out with the, the, the cloud and the fire, and that God was with them, God was working through them, the miracles that had taken place in Egypt, all these things that they had witnessed. And they believed God with their whole heart, and they believed God was with Moses. And they get out there and don't have any water, and they start becoming a little frustrated by it. And they get to the point where it says in verse 7, the phrase was, is the Lord among us or not? How times can change. How do you think those people felt when it came time for Moses to die before they went into the promised land? You know the story by that. 
you know, they had followed Moses all this time. They had been with him, and Moses was frustrated by it as well. But when they went into the promised land, what was it that happened to Moses? Moses didn't go in the promised land, did he? Moses was forbidden to go in. And so things had to be passed over to Joshua. Now, how do you think the people felt? How would you have felt after all this 40 years of following Moses and seeing Moses being God's servant, and then suddenly leadership changes and it's Joshua? Only two of them went from the, the original tribe, from the original group, Joshua and Caleb. Can't you just hear some of them saying, well, how can this young upstart come up here and take over? He hadn't had the experience that Moses has had. What a change they had to go through. I mean, it was, it was tough. Sometimes do we test God like the people of Israel did? They tested God right and left, didn't they? They questioned God over and over. And you, know, what, you have to ask yourself the question, what more could God do to show that he was with them? Well, it involves a matter of faith, doesn't it? truly does. It, it involves faith. It involves believing in what God says and what he wants us to do and how he wants us to think about it. Any, any thoughts on the people of Israel coming out of Egypt and those 40 years of wandering around and, and the, the, the way that their life changed and yet the simple fact was God was there. God was, was going to be with them. God had shown them he was going to be with them. But God wanted them to be doing certain things. He really and truly did. He wanted them to be living their lives a certain way and being and trusting in him, you know, would we have acted any differently? Probably not. Probably not. You know, we can look back at some of these examples, and, and I, I cherish some of these examples. I feel sorry for what took place and what happened, but some of these examples are so good that hopefully we can learn from those mistakes, that as, as we see these changes that took place in their life, that we can look back and realize yeah, we don't want to make the same mistakes today. We don't want to doubt the fact that God is going to, to be with us and, and lead us and take us wherever he wants us to go. Over in Jeremiah chapter 29, turn over there if you would. And this second point is one that I, is kind of, you don't think about very often in these terms. But it has to do with the Jews returning from Babylon, going back to Jerusalem after the captivity. Did you ever think that if you were in captivity that you wouldn't want to go back to where you were? That's what happened to the people of, uh, for the, the Jewish people as they were coming out of captivity. Some of them didn't want to go back to Jerusalem. Now why was that? Well, for one thing, how long were they supposed to have been in, Jeru in, in Babylon from the captivity? Jeremiah 29 says they were going to be there 70 years. You know, that really gets your attention when you go into captivity and God said, if they still believed God that, to that way. But he said, you're going to be there 70 years. That's a long time. I'm not even 70 yet. So I would have lived my whole life there. Some of these people lived their whole lives there. They were born in captivity and they had never seen Jerusalem. So anyway, in chapter 29, Jeremiah says, Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, verse 4, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, dwell in them, take wives, beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. This is where the Jews became merchants and traders in their history. This is where it started. They went from being farmers for the most part in an agrarian society into this aspect of, of what they were doing in life. And it's even carried down to today. He says in verse 10, for after 70 years will be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. And God did do that. God visited them and God brought them out of captivity. And God caused them to return back to Jerusalem. And some of these people if you read over into uh, this other part of uh, Jeremiah here, you find out that some of these people really were not interested in going back to Jerusalem, as we're going to see when we get to the, this little spot here in Ezra as well. Um, 
they were satisfied with it, where they were living. Times were good. And that's hard, hard to kind of grasp that either. So they experienced something as they were getting ready to go back to, to Jerusalem that was very hard for them to understand, I'm sure, is over in Isaiah chapter 45, there was a man who was called and chosen of God to allow them to go back to Jerusalem. His name was a man by the name of Cyrus. Now, how? think about this. We're not going to have time to go through the scriptures and things, but Cyrus was a man who was what? He was a foreigner. He was a pagan. He didn't know God. He didn't know much about God's law. He knew, knew about the Jews, but he really wasn't that concerned about anything other than he was chosen by God, as it says in chapter 45, to go back and allow these people to go to return to Jerusalem to build the temple. How do you think these people felt when they realized what was going on? Do you think they really trusted him or believed him? Would you? I don't know that I would. We could use all sorts of examples today of, of, of people that are in, in the business world and people have no idea and understanding about God and his word you know, coming up with some kind of a plan to do something to help Christianity, would you, be, would you be willing to trust them? Probably not. It would take some thought. It really would. But anyway, it says here in verse 1, chapter 45, to the Lord, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. And he goes on to say what he's going to do to him. He said, for in verse 4, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have surnamed you, though you have not known me. So, obviously, he didn't know God, but yet God was going to use him. These times have changed. God can do all sorts of things. And one of the things that we have to realize is that, that God can, can use whatever means and whatever way to fulfill his purpose in preaching the gospel, fulfilling the gospel, before the return of Christ. And we may be sometime left in the dark as to how he's going to do it. We could ask a lot of questions. We could say, what is God going to do next? My answer, I have no idea. How is he going to go about doing this? Who is going to be out there doing things for God? Are there going to be a number of people? Probably. Well, do we have any more specifics as to how God's going to do things? Not really. We just know what God says he will do. But when I, when I see a lot of these, these older gentlemen who have been serving God for years and years and years, and, and I had a few people ask me, you know, literally with a question, you know, what, what is going to happen next when these men are all gone? Well, they're just about all gone. Well, my answer is I, I'm not that concerned about it. That's something God will take care of. But you can't give specifics because you don't know. I'm not going to try to second guess God. I've seen too many people that have tried to do that. I've seen too many people come up with dates for things. What was it? The end of the, the, end of the world was supposed to be when? In this last October, some, somebody, somebody came up with some date. And uh, some, one of my friends was wanting to place a bet with me. And I said, believe me, you don't want to bet with me because it's not going to happen. So I didn't bet him even though he was trying to, and then when it didn't happen, he said, you know, you're pretty smart. And I said, no, I'm not smart. I said, I just understand what God's word says. And I said, it's not going to happen today or tomorrow. But see, there's so much in people's lives, they just pay a little attention to God's word, they would learn a little bit more. Returning from Babylon to Jerusalem was a change for the people of Israel. That I don't think we can ever understand how much of a change it was. In Ezra, just on a couple scriptures in Ezra, I want to mention to you. Ezra chapter 3, beginning in verse... I'm not going to have time to read verses 10 through 13, but basically what happened is they laid the foundation of the temple in verse 10. Uh, there were priests out there. Levites, they were dancing and praising God with the symbols and everything. And then in verse 12, it said, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house 
when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. You had, you had these people who saw this temple being rebuilt. The old timers realized what Solomon's temple was like and they realized that this new temple was never going to be what Solomon's was. The younger generation that had lived their life in captivity and came back had never seen the first one. And they were shouting for joy because they were seeing something take place and being brought back from captivity to begin to worship God again. So you had, a, had mixed feelings there. And they had to live with that. And there's a danger of comparing the past. We don't want to reminisce about past things, about past changes that have taken place. Because if we do that, then we, we kind of block success. Because life has to go on and we have to make sure it takes place. The last point I've got to think about, what took place in the book of Acts right after the death of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus appeared to the disciples and to a number of them for 40 days. It says here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. He showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. How many days was it before Pentecost? Between Passover and Pentecost, how many days? 50. Well, he only appeared to them for 40 days, didn't he? What do you think they thought about for the next 10 days when he disappeared? A good question. What would you have thought about? Well, there's a lot of things we could think about. You, you, you think about what's going to happen in 10 days. First of all, Jesus told them they would receive power from on high. Well, what did that mean to them? Well, he, they didn't know. They didn't know what to expect. You know, those 10 days were probably, there was probably a lot of talking going on back and forth of kind of guessing and second guessing as to what was going to happen. Did they think maybe that the kingdom of God would, would appear in 10 days and that the Romans would be overthrown and Christ's kingdom would be set up and that would be the end of things? Probably. I think I would have because that's what they expected. That's what they wanted to take place. They wanted their whole life to change. And it wasn't going to happen under the Roman Empire. They were pretty cruel. You know, the Persians that allowed the people to go back from Babylon to Jerusalem were, we were dealt with people a little differently. They allowed them to be their own people. Romans didn't like that. Romans they had them under an iron fist. Well, they, they thought about a lot of things, but what, it, what happened was it did happen. In 10 days, they received power from on high. But that 10-day period, I'm sure there was a lot of thoughts in their mind as to about what was going to happen. You know, they were talking about what God was going to do, and yet they had no idea other than what they were told to do was stay and wait in Jerusalem. You know, it was only 120 people that were, were willing to do that. And they were of one mind and of one accord. You know the story. You know. And you had to stay in Jerusalem to receive the Holy Spirit under those circumstances. To do what God said. You know, it's easy to talk of God. It's easy to talk about God. It's easy to talk of what God might do. But trusting and having faith is a very, very important part of our life that we need to pass on to the younger generation. Believing without seeing. And that's hard to do, I think, with a younger generation when they've got everything at their fingertips. Isn't it? They want something, they push a button, it appears. I can't do that because I have trouble operating the controller for the television, most part. It's just... Uh, you have so much available at your fingertips, but when it comes to God, God sometimes makes us wait. And I wonder sometimes that this younger generation, if we had a big change where the electronic part of it, you know, disappeared, and electricity was shut off in a couple days, they wouldn't know what to do. They really wouldn't, because they depend on it so much. What was it that God told Joshua? We just got a few minutes left here back in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. <clears throat> Moses had died, and God told Joshua, he said, be strong, be of good courage. 
In other words, believe in me. Have faith in me. I'll be with you. I will give you the strength to do whatever needs to be done. Isn't that basically the same thing he tells us as he tells Christians that are a part of the body of Christ? He tells us to trust in him, to believe in him. And that believing involves sometimes waiting a little bit. Because I wish I had the answers. I, I, every, every time somebody important that's been around for years, the evangelists, senior pastors or whatever, whenever they, they pass on, people always ask and, want to know, and have the you know, question, you know, what is, going, what is God going to do? I have no idea. But I know he's going to do it. And that's the one thing we have to leave them with. You know, God calls us and God equips us and you and me to meet the needs of tomorrow. What are some of those needs? Well, each generation should get better. Each generation should learn to understand the responsibility we have in life. Our job is to equip them to handle life, to handle circumstances. And believe me, as, as grandparents and parents nowadays, the things that we have to deal with, with young children on is nothing, nothing like what we had when we were growing up. I just am amazed at how, how you can take children today and help them get through society with the things they have to go through. You know, things were simpler when I was growing up, you bet. A lot simpler. And it was a whole lot simpler with, with my parents, but the change has taken place from the time of my parents to me, and now from me to my grandchildren is phenomenal. And I think all of you understand that, and, and which means our job is really cut out for us. The most important thing I think I can leave with you today with, with what we have to do with our responsibility is that our actions must match the faith that we proclaim. That's really important. We've got to do that. And we could talk far more, <coughs> excuse me, about the Apostle Paul and his conversion and the change that took place in the New Testament church when he walked through the door to, to preach. You talk about people that didn't believe it, would you have believed it? The Apostle Paul being what he was, suddenly coming in to preach. What about the Gentiles who were considered less than human receiving the Holy Spirit? Do you think that wasn't a change they had to deal with, the New Testament church did? Oh, they dealt with it over and over again. It was not easy. And I feel sorry for the Apostle Paul and what he had to go through to try to help them understand that. That was tough, but it took place. We saw the Holy Spirit being given to the New Testament church. What a change that brought to people that didn't know what to expect. It changed their lives. It's changed your life. It's changed my life. I remember Dennis Pyle when I was in high school, a senior, pretty much told me I had to be in spokesman's club. I told him I didn't have any need to be because I didn't plan on ever doing any public speaking. Look how that turned out. It turned out like I didn't ever expect, believe me. Anyway, we could, we could go, go on and on with this, but we don't have time. Remember what God expects of us. Remember that it's going to affect everybody. We're going to see change. We're going to deal with it, and we're going to go forward with it. The when, the how, the who, the what God is going to do, I don't have an answer for that, other than the fact I know it's going to take place and it'll happen and it'll be done properly. These are just some of my thoughts on some history lessons, some things we can learn, so let's look at it, let's think about it,